Section 24 of Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Scott Bennett. Little Masterpieces of American Wit and Humor, Volume 2. Edited by Thomas Lansing Masson. Section 24. THE THOMPSON STREET POKER CLUB by Henry Guy Carleton Some Curious Points in the Noble Game Unfolded When Mr. Tudor Williams entered the gilded halls of the Thompson Street Poker Club Saturday evening, it was evident that fortune had smeared him with prosperity. He wore a straw hat with a blue ribbon, an expression of serene content, and a glass amethyst on his third finger, whose effulgence irradiated the whole room and made the envious eyes of Mr. Cyanide Whiffles stand out like a crab's. Besides these extraordinary furbishments, Mr. Williams had his moustache waxed to fine points, and his back hair was precious with the luster and richness which accompany the use of the attar of Third Avenue roses, combined with the bear's grease dispensed by basement barbers on that fashionable thoroughfare. In sharp contrast to this scintillating entrance was the coming of the Reverend Mr. Thankful Smith, who had been disheveled by the heat, discolored by a dusty evangelical trip to Coney Island, and oppressed by an attack of malaria which made his eyes bloodshot and enriched his respiration with occasional hiccups, and that steady aroma which is said to dwell in Weehawken breweries. The game began at eight o'clock, and by nine, and a series of two-pair hands and bull luck, Mr. Gus Johnson was seven dollars and a nickel ahead of the game, and the Reverend Mr. Thankful Smith, who was banking, was nine stacks of chips and a dollar bill on the wrong side of the ledger. Mr. Cyanide Whiffles was cheerful as a cricket over four winnings amounting to sixty-nine cents. Professor Brick was calm, and Mr. Tudor Williams was gorgeous and hopeful and laying low for the first jackpot, which now came. It was Mr. Whiffles's deal, and feeling that the eyes of the world were upon him, he passed around the cards with a precision and rapidity which were more to his credit than the I.O.U. from Mr. Williams, which was left over from the previous meeting. Professor Brick had nine high and declared his inability to make an opening. Mr. Williams noticed a dangerous light come into the Reverend Mr. Smith's eye and hesitated a moment, but having two black jacks and a pair of trays, opened with the limit. "'I lifts you just three dollars toot,' said the Reverend Mr. Smith, getting out the wallet and shaking out a wad. Mr. Gus Johnson, who had a four-flush and very little prudence, came in. Mr. Whiffles sighed and fled. Mr. Williams polished the amethyst, thoroughly examining a scratch on one of its facets, adjusted his collar, skinned his cards, stealthily glanced again at the expression of the Reverend Mr. Smith's eye, and said he would just, just call. Mr. Whiffles supplied the wants of the gentleman from the pack with the mechanical air of a man who had lost all hope in a hereafter. Mr. Williams wanted one card. The Reverend Mr. Smith said he'd take about three, and Mr. Gus Johnson expressed a desire for a club if it was not too much trouble. Mr. Williams caught another tray, and being secretly pleased, led out by betting a chip. The Reverend Mr. Smith uproariously slammed down a stack of blue chips and raised him seven dollars. Mr. Gus Johnson had captured the nine of hearts, and so retired. Mr. Williams had four chips and a dollar left. "'I sees that seven, he said impressively, "'and I humps it ten mo. "'Why's de collateral? queried the Reverend Mr. Smith calmly, but with aggressiveness in his eye. Mr. Williams sniffed contemptuously, drew off the ring, and deposited it in the pot with such an air as to impress Mr. Whiffles with the idea that the jewel must have been worth at least four million dollars. Then Mr. Williams leaned back in his chair and smiled. 
"'What you going to do?' asked the Reverend Mr. Smith, deliberately ignoring Mr. Williams's action. Mr. Williams pointed to the ring and smiled. "'Lift yo ten dollars.' "'On wood? "'Dat ring.' "'Dat ring?' "'Yes, yeah, sir.' Mr. Williams was still cool. "'Huh!' The Reverend Mr. Smith picked the ring up, examined it scientifically with one eye closed, dropped it several times as if to test its soundness, and then walked across and rasped it several times heavily on the window pane. "'What you doing dat for?' excitedly asked Mr. Williams. A double rasp with the ring was the Reverend Mr. Smith's only reply. "'Give me that jewel back,' demanded Mr. Williams. The Reverend Mr. Smith was now vigorously rubbing the setting of the stone on the floor. "'Let go that sparkler,' said Mr. Williams again. The Reverend Mr. Smith carefully polished off the scratches by rubbing the ring a while on the sole of his foot. Then he resumed his seat and put the precious thing back into the pot. Then he looked calmly at Mr. Williams and leaned back in his chair as if waiting for something. "'Is yo satisfied?' said Mr. Williams in the tone used by men who have sustained a deep injury. "'This is poker,' said the Reverend Mr. Thankful Smith. "'I rised yo ten dollars,' said Mr. Williams, pointing to the ring. "'Did yer ever saw three balls hanging over my dough?' asked the Reverend Mr. Smith. "'Doesn't yo know my name hain't Oppenheimer?' "'What do yo mean?' asked Mr. Williams excitedly. "'Poker am poker, and dar's no occasion for trifling with blue glass and junk in dis yar club,' said the Reverend Mr. Smith. "'I lift yo ten dollars,' said Mr. Williams, ignoring the insult. "'Put up de collateral," said the Reverend Mr. Smith. Four chips is forty, and a dollar's a dollar forty, and that's a dollar forty-four cents. Was de four cents, smiled Mr. Williams desperately. The Reverend Mr. Smith pointed to the ring. Mr. Williams rose indignantly, shucked off his coat, hat, vest, suspenders, and scarf pin, heaped them on the table, then sat down and glared at the Reverend Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith rolled up the coat, put on the hat, threw his own out the window, gave the ring to Mr. Whiffles, jammed the suspenders into his pocket, and took in the vest, chips, and money. "'Dis yas burglary!' yelled Mr. Williams. The Reverend Mr. Smith spread out four eights and rose impressively. "'Toot!' he said. "'Don't trifle with providence!' Because a man wars ten-cent grease and gets his jewelry on de bowery, it's no sign that he can buck again cash in a jacker and get a boodle from four eights. Yo's now in your shirt sleeves and low spirits, but your spins and wallable. I's willing to stand a beer and sassinger and shake and call it squire. De club now, Jern. Mr. Blaine used to tell this story. Once in Dublin, toward the end of the opera, Satan was conducting Faust through a trap door which represented the gates of Hades. His majesty got through all right. He was used to going below, but Faust, who was quite stout, got only about halfway in, and no squeezing would get him any farther. Suddenly an Irishman in the gallery exclaimed devoutly, "'Thank God! Hell is full!' While Mark Twain was ill in London, a report that he had died was circulated. It spread to America and reached Charles Dudley Warner in Hartford, Connecticut. Mr. Warner immediately cabled to London to find out if it was really so. The cablegram, in some way, came directly into the humorist's hands, and he forthwith cabled the following reply. Reports of my death greatly exaggerated. End of section 24